Okay. <clears throat> so Dermatology 3 really puts everything together, puts it into perspective, uh, starts to kind of have a little bit of overlap here. We'll have more overlap in peds, and then um, it, it should all kind of come together after peds, and we'll review on Thursday <clears throat> after that pediatric lecture anything that you guys are still confused about in the study guide or um, things that have come up in the lecture that you do not understand. So the difficult part with dermatology is that um, dermatology is so broad and a lot of things don't sit in pockets. So there's kind of this smattering of stuff um, that all doesn't really have a home but this is the rest of the story for dermatology. So some of this stuff we already touched on like melasma and vitiligo, but we'll go over them again, just to kind of cement them in. But these are the topics that we're gonna go over today. So acanthosis nigricans, which we already kind of talked about. It's a benign disorder. Uh, the description of these velvety hyperpigmented areas, hyperpigmented is probably the biggest take home buzzword for this. Um, they're usually in the axilla, the groin, sometimes around the neck or umbilicus area. Obesity is the most common cause. Um, also insulin resistance plays a role here too. Can be induced by drugs, malignancies, or endocrine disorders, so don't forget that. The management of it is really, um, pretty basic. There's not a lot to do. There's not a lot of things that are going to take this completely away. So um, cautioning your patient that um, this could be around for a long time is good. You can refer them to dermatology. They may try a topical tretinoin um, or topical vitamin D analog. There's also this calcipoptril um, which is something that can be used. So systemic retinoids um, can help with clinical improvement. Um, with extensive and severe disease, there is a um, predisposition to relapse. So here's what this condition kind of looks like. Remember, this is the hyperpigmented site. Um, and then also you can get these acrocordons. So it, uh, in the obese population, particularly, plus just like a lot of um, areas that have high friction, what you'll see are these um, skin tags called acrocordons that will also present in these high friction zones. So that's pretty normal. This is the areolar component. Um, melasma, which we talked about last time. Um, the melasma is a acquired hyperpigmentation, typically in sun exposed areas. And these areas are going to include the face, neck, forehead, cheeks, and upper lip. It is most common in women and seen in darker persons with darker complexions. Um, moving on, so melasma continued. They're usually kind of these irregular in shape. They're, they go from having the melasma to not. Um, we'll look at some pictures here. Brown or dark brown macules, so they're flat. Um, similar condition uh, is seen in people with chronic liver disease, and this is called colasma. So melasma adenosine, adenosine, adenosine is seen with Addison's disease. The management of melasma is to utilize a sunscreen because that's going to help prevent continuation or the formation of more lesions. Um, should be applied every couple hours. And then also you can do this triple combination cream, including hydroquinine, tretinoin, and this um, flu fluconin, fluconolon, Ooh, bear with me here with some of these pronunciations, acetamide, and that is usually first line therapy is that triple therapy. So examples of melasma, here's an example of uh, 
the cheek here with melasma, this hyperpigmented area, which is a common um, finding with melasma. Vitiligo is an acquired skin depigmentation disorder seen in about 1% of the population. This individual here was affected by it. Um, results from an autoimmune process that degrades the melanocytes. So the melanocytes don't work properly so they do not secrete melanin in that area and can also be associated with other autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease, pernicious anemia, systemic lupus, and Addison's disease. Facts about vitiligo, well, it's autoimmune, can be associated with thyroid disease or Graves' disease, so keep that in mind. Also can be associated with type 1 diabetes and adrenal insufficiency, as well as hypopituitarism. Um, vitiligo can... Um, occur also idiopathically. Um, so we want to make sure that we investigate these possibilities for the patient, but it's not always going to be the case. It could just be um, something that's unknown as to the cause, although we do know that it's autoimmune mediated. So lab tests, we want to check their thyroid, make sure that they don't have any pernicious anemia, and then also check a fasting glucose, because those are other coexisting disorders that can occur. There's different types. There's a generalized type, an acrofacial type, and then a whole bunch of different subtypes. So when we diagnose this, we want to um, make sure that we look at them under a woods lamp to make sure that they're um, are no other uh, fungal infections that are causing the pigmentation change. Um, we want to think about these other differentials like lichen sclerosis, nevus depigmentus, pityriasis alba, lupus, pityriasis versicolor, mel melanoma, or a corticosteroid induced dermopathy. Management, kind of like a lot of these things, these topical or oral corticosteroids, those are going to decrease the immune response, which will help with the morphology. Also, you can do an ultraviolet light treatment, and then you can even think about skin grafting. Usually no treatment, but management with sunscreen and observation. So here's some generalized vitiligo, acrofacial vitiligo, and then another generalized vitiligo. Hadridinitis suppurativa. So this is a chronic infection of the apocrine glands. Um, initially, there is some follicular occlusion, and then that results in the formation of these cystic structures and leads to local inflammation and destruction of follicles and then you end up with these scars from the chronic inflammatory component of this hydratinitis suppurativa, this pitting of the skin. Um, hydratinitis suppurativa is also um, associated with um, acne inversa. So this is the terms are kind of used collectively. So on initial management, um, we want to see if the inf if there's inflammation going on, um, the nodules can rupture. The discharge is usually purulent and sometimes foul smelling due to the bacteria that is causing the infectious process. There may be sinus tracts and comedomes secondary to the scarring and chronic inflammation. The axilla is the most common site, but you can see them pretty much anywhere. You have apocrine glands, so your groin area, um, the perennial area, and then under the armpits bilaterally. The diagnosis um, is based on 
clinical presentation and is often misdiagnosed. They can be diagnosed with a, a furuncle or a boil, um, but generally if these are recurring, we want to consider hydratinized suprativa. Successful treatment requires lifeline, lifelong attention at all stages of disease. So behavioral modification, taking the systemic or topical steroids, and then surgical intervention to eliminate nodules is also helpful. A lot of times these people are on uh, chronic antibiotic therapy with like doxycycline or something like that to prevent infectious infections from forming. Pylonidal cyst. So a pylonidal cyst is this cyst that occurs right here in this gluteal fold. Pylonidal cavities um, is where the cyst occurs um, and it may sinus tract from other locations. So it is an acquired condition um, at the skin in the overlying natal cleft is what they call that area. It breaks down um, the hair follicles um, can also be involved and can um, be a factor. Um, if they contain hair and debris, that's more likely to become infectious and cause um, some sort of a hyperproliferation of bacteria in that site and then cause a cystic structure to form. Risk factors are basically kind of this high friction zone, so sitting a lot, a deep natal cleft, if you're overweight, if you've had a localized trauma or irritation to that site that can make the body kind of hypersensitive, or if you have a sedentary lifestyle. On physical exam, we want to obviously uh, see where the site is, where it anatomically located. We want to find out if it's inflamed or not, if it needs to be managed by incision and drainage, or if we can trial some antibiotic therapy. So there's that natal cleft. So pylonidal sinus tract, there's the pylonidal cavity. It, it's going to have a hair probably in there that leads to this infectious process and, and the tract gets inflamed and plugged and then you end up with more inflammation. The hair follicle pores you might see and then you may see that pylonidal sinus. Um, differentials, we want to think about a perianal fistula, a perianal abscess, is it hydratinitis, is it an infected sebaceous cyst, or a sacral osteomyelitis. So this is a perirectal abscess, a uh, perianal abscess, and obviously this is warm hot, it is not in the pylonidal region, it's in adjacent to the anus, so this is considered a perianal abscess and not a pylonidal cyst. Management is incision and drainage. We're gonna pack these people. They basically uh, pack, you incise that, you debride as much as you can, and then you uh, pack, pack and pack and pack and pack as it slowly heals from the bottom up. So when you cut one of these open, the incision looks like that. And then what's happening is you're packing and then covering with a gauze and then you pull the packing a couple days later and what happens is this cyst will slowly heal from the bottom up and so what you'll see is this white kind of granulation tissue that's for forming as you continue to remove the packing it just keeps kind of filling itself in from bottom to top until the pylonidal cyst is completely scarred over um, so what's a decubitus ulcer? So it's basically a localized injury to the skin that um, breaks through the dermis because that's the um, way that we define an ulceration is it has to break through the dermis. Usually from a bony protuberance that is having a lot of friction or pressure applied to it. Pressure ulcers are typically related to immobility, people who are bed bound or chair bound, um, but can also be from poorly fitting casts or medical equipment. It's something that has contact to the skin um, for an extended period of time. 
So these are kind of the typical sites where we get them. Basically, they're from the pressure. So you can get them in the back of the head, scapula, the vertebrae, the sacrum or coccyx, the calcaneus. If they're laying on their stomach, then it's going to be the opposite, right? And if they're side sleepers, then really like this greater trochanter is a big area to get them. A lot of people get them here in the sacral area or the coccyx. Um, so it's just basically an interaction between external factors and it's host specific, usually due to immobility, also worsened by things like incontinence or um, poor health. If they have compromised nutrition, that's gonna also um, add and be a factor in tissue damage. Decreased skin perfusion also. So if these people aren't getting up and moving around, they're gonna have decreased perfusion to their tissues, which is going to result in increased risk of forming ulcers. Um, superficial skin susceptibility to pressure induced damage, uh, more susceptible to the, than the deeper tissues. Um, so the superficial skin is usually a little bit more uh, resilient where the deeper tissues are more susceptible to that pressure damage. Um, so the superficial tissue may look decent, but there can be damage below that. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so this Braden scale is a scale that they use to assess someone's risk for forming pressure ulcers. And it's basically these components which drive the Braden scale. Um, you get a score <clears throat> for each one, whether they're um, responding to sensory stimuli, there's a, a different grading scale for each one. The amount of moisture over the sites, their amount of activity, mobility, their nutrition, and then the friction or shear score. So at any rate, the higher the score, um, the less at risk they are, and then the lower the score, the more high risk they are. There's also a Norton score, which kind of does the same type of idea. And basically, the lower the score, the greater the risk, the higher the score, the less risk. So National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel staging. So this is a stage one ulcer is characterized as just non-blanchable redness and localized irritation over a bony patch. So it's, there's no skin breakdown. The stage two is a partial thickness dermal loss. And stage three is characterized as full thickness dermal loss. These are things that are high yield. So you'll wanna make sure that you particularly know these stages. Stage four is considered full thickness, thickness skin loss with exposed bone or tendon. We'll look at some of these. And then unstageable are considered unstageable when there's full thickness tissue loss at the base of the ulcer is covered by slough. Okay, so there's an escher there or some sort of um, wound that you can't really see how deep it goes. And then suspected deep tissue injury should be expected, suspected whenever there is localized area of discoloration in the intact skin. Um, especially overlying one of those bony prominences. So here's some pressure ulcers. These are what stage one is A, stage two B, stage three C, and then stage four. So managing these, basically we wanna reduce friction. So putting some sort of a topical um, emollient will help them slide around like Vaseline or um, some sort of a wound cream. Um, you want know, to provide uh, really appropriate wound care and early on um, because once these form, they're really hard to get to go away. And once they start forming with these patients that are laying on the bed more often, it's more of a problem because they're constantly at risk of returning. So provide some psychosocial support as well as these um, are going to require that the patient have um, some support structure in place. 
urticaria and angioedema. So these are both allergic reactions. Urticaria is common. It affects about 20% of the population and most of the causes are idiopathic. Sometimes we think it's due to stress. Sometimes there's an aller allergic component, but if it's chronic, then we really need to think about working this up a little bit more. You can do CBC, you can do skin testing for hypersensitivity. You can um, work them up for food or environmental allergens. You can do an anti-nuclear antibody panel to look for autoimmune disease. And then the C4 test, which is a complement test. Um, urticarial lesions are defined as intensely pruritic, so very itchy, circumscribed, so well-defined round, uh, raised erythematous plaques with a central pallor. So let's look at these. So this is urticarial reaction. This is caused by some sort of allergen. And the bottom line is a lot of times we don't find out. So we want to communicate that with to, to our patients that, hey, you know what, 90% of these we never find out, but this is what we do. This is how we treat it. You know, if it continues to occur, then we need to really go looking for the cause. So really the bottom line of treatment here is to remove the um, causative agent, right? So if they know the trigger, that's nice, then we can remove that. So um, when I see this on people, I try to find out, you know, if they've started anything new, if they're, um, you know, started a new medication, started a new cream, using a new laundry detergent, um, anything that might cause um, a new reaction by the body. It's not always true that it's something brand new that they were exposed to. Sometimes it's something that they've used for years, like, you know, um, Tide soap or something like that. And then all of a sudden they have a reaction to it. It doesn't always necessarily have to be something brand new, but it is easiest to elicit if it's something new. Um, but the treatment is pretty um, basic. It's antihistamines. You can also use H2 blocker, blocker like cimetidine or ranitidine, which is not, ranitidine is not available, but cimetidine is. You can use prednisone, oral or injectable. Um, usually I'm putting people on 50 milligrams of prednisone for five days take it with food and take it in the morning. And usually that really kicks it, kicks it down. Um, you can also give them topical steroid like a corticosteroid, which will help with the itching and then um, an antihistamine like Benadryl, which also will help. However, those antihistamines that are first gen are going to make them tired. So usually I have them take those at night, maybe even take a second gen during the day. But that's kind of what we do in the clinic for those reactions. Angioedema. So angioedema <clears throat> is a intense reaction that causes um, effects to the skin, normally in the face and lips, mouth and throat. Um, so particularly scary for airway involvement. It can and oftentimes is asymmetric. So you'll see this lip that's like super swollen on one side and the other side's not swollen at all. Um, it can also be, um, uh, it can present with a colicky abdominal pain, colicky abdominal pain or GI upset in the presence of a allergic reaction is actually more concerning for anaphylaxis or angioedema. So don't blow off anybody that says that their stomach hurts and they're having an allergic reaction. That's a real deal and you need to take that person seriously. So angioedema may be life-threatening because it can cause airway obstruction, represents a component of anaphylaxis. So anytime somebody has an anaphylactic reaction, they'll usually complain about nausea or vomiting um, or abdominal pain, and we need to take these people really seriously because sometimes the GI upset is the only symptom that we might see. And so if we're worried about something like that, we need to treat these patients fairly aggressively. 
So here's an example of angioedema. This is the lip, obviously um, very common for um, certain populations to have reaction to lisinopril and cause angioedema. Two types of angioedema, there's a mast cell mediated and then bradykinin mediated. These are um, the main causes. However, there are other etiologies associated with angioedema. Here's kind of a flow sheet on how to treat angioedema. So, you know, you can work your way down this, but um, it basically goes from, you know, is the patient's airway compromised? No, okay, now try to determine the cause. Is urticaria present? No. Um, is the patient taking an ACE inhibitor? Yes, stop the ACE inhibitor. So just kind of use this flow chart. Um, it's interesting algorithm to see how we kind of treat that. Burns, so burns uh, are common to see in primary care, urgent care and emergency care. They're defined as this um, cutaneous um, irritation of the skin or injury. Um, and then we've got different uh, stages of burns. Um, and then we also want to assess the total body surface area, which um, is a good indicator of how severe the burn is and how much management this burn is going to require. So when we talk about burns, we we'll talk about a superficial burn, which is a first degree burn, then a superficial partial thickness burn, a deep partial thickness burn, and full partial thickness burn, which um, we're considering to be second degree and third degree, and then fourth degree burn goes all the way down to the fascia. So um, now we're getting away kind of from first, second, and third, and they're going to this superficial, superficial par partial thickness, superficial deep thickness. At any rate, it's still first, second, and third as far as medical professionals go. So the estimated percentage of total surface body includes partial thickness and full thickness and fourth degree burns. So your second third and fourth degree burns. If you're talking about superficial burns, you don't really need to include total body surface area in the assessment. The most accurate method, method for doing this in adults and children is the Lund-Browder chart. And then also the rule of nines is good for assessment in adults. It is uh, a very quick method. So here's the rule of nines. So um, you can figure this out, but each leg represents 18%. Each arm represents 9%. The anterior and posterior trunk, trunk each represent 18%, and the head represents another 9%. Also, the palm of your hand can be considered 1%. So sometimes people will use that also. Um, so this is a superficial burn, right? We don't have to calculate total body surface burn area here. Um, management of superficial burns is basically to rupture any um, blisters and debride them and then utilize topical antibiotic, um, as some sort of gauze that's not going to stick, and then we want to change this gauze out every 24 to 48 hours and control the pain. Some superficial partial thickness burns can be managed by primary care unless they're involving the face, palms, or soles. As these are more likely to form scar tissue and inhibit someone's function. So we want to at least refer these children to Harborview so that they can be um, treated accordingly. So these kids will need close follow-up with Harborview. There's an example of a scalding burn. So a child that pulls water onto themselves and gets this terribly scalding burn. It's extremely painful. The problem with burns is as they heal, they scar down. And so this is going to be an extensive process. Here is a full thickness burn. So this burn goes all the way deep into the tissue and into the fascia itself. The scary thing about these burns is they don't hurt because all the superficial tissue has been taken away so there's no nerve left. 
And so this is somebody that's going to get some skin grafts. So here's just kind of a um, another flow chart here for burns. So you've got the A, B, C, D, E, right? So, you know, you do your ABCs, um, and then you're going to use the rule of nines, and we're going to um, just kind of make sure that, that they're treated correctly, that we're fluid replacing and doing what we need to do. Um, so this is interesting to kind of look through. Electrical burns, so there's three mechanisms uh, for electrical burn. It can be electric current injury, a conversion of electrical energy to thermal energy, so heat, or a blunt mechanical energy like lightning, um, muscle contraction. So they're, they're mus your muscles are going to um, contract really hard and you're gonna fall when you get a blunt mechanical injury. Um, four classes, so the body part of uh, the circuit with an entry and exit wound. There's the flash arc burns that strike the skin but don't enter the body. The flame injury to clothing catching on fire and then the shock wave is a lightning injury. So particularly in these shock wave injuries, we want to be concerned about organ damage and especially these entry exit wounds. We want to think that there's material in there that we can't see that's being affected. Organ involvement in electrical injury. So multiple organ systems may be affected, although we don't see that. Basing the degree of injury on entry and exit wounds um, will result in underestimating the degree of wound. So cardiac 15% will have an arrhythmia, 60% will go into V-fib. Um, so we want to watch for that. Renal, they can go into rhabdomyolysis um, and some massive tissue necrosis. There can be extravasation, extravasation of fluids. They can have neurologic damage, peripheral or central neurologic damage, obviously the skin damage, and then musculoskeletal um, damage. Bone has the highest resistance, and so it generates the greatest amount of heat. So that's something we want to keep in our minds as well. If you fry somebody's bone marrow, that's not going to be a good thing. Muscle contraction um, are so aggressive that they can cause fractures and eventually rhabdomyolysis from the breakdown um, of muscle tissue. So when we do a physical exam on somebody with an electrical injury, we want to always start with our ABCs, BCL, BLS, and ACLS. We're going to assess their cardiovascular system, skin, neurologic function, do a full ENT exam, a musculoskeletal exam, and then we want to do some studies like an EKG, CMP, troponin, CBC, and some x-rays to the injured areas. Moving on to erythema nodosum. So erythema nodosum is one of these kind of categories that just kind of lives on its own. These are these painful erythematous nodules typically develop on the legs, okay? They're kind of like this bruise-like lesion. They actually, um, originate from the adipose tissue. So they're kind of deep. Um, they're going to have systemic features like polyarthralgia, fever, malaise. They can have an elevated erythrocyte count because it's largely inflammatory. They're associated with many different causes. That's what probably makes this one so vexing, but can be associated with tuberculosis, leprosy, fungal infections, inflammatory bowel disease, bacterial infections, drug reactions from uh, some of your common uh, problem makers here, penicillin, sulfa, and over-the-counter uh, or oral contraceptive uh, pills. Management is going to be stopping the causative agent. You want to instruct them that this is generally self-limiting. Symptoms um, can be treated as they occur. You can use NSAIDs for pain relief. Also, also potassium iodide, it does seem to stop the duration. We're not exactly sure why. And then steroid use is controversial here. Um, but I think that steroid use seems to be um, probably indicated, however, is listed as second line. 
So here's just kind of a summary here because this is, seems to be vexing. Uh, more common in women. Um, so you're basically 20 to 40 year old woman. Uh, these tender erythematous nodules in the shins. Uh, they look like they got beat up kind of, um, but they're self-limiting. You can use NSAIDs, potassium iodide, and corticosteroids. Here's another test question on a answer that you do not know already, <laughs> just like I had told you before um, with the last test question. So you have a 53-year-old diabetic male with painful crusted ulcer on his right shin. What is your most likely diagnosis? Okay, so this is on the shin. Um, it's definitely not a decubitus ulcer because he's not laying on his shins, so we can knock that out. There's not a really good situation where we would say, yes, this is an insect bite, right? Could be, could be, but the stem's really not leading me that way, so I'm gonna say no there. There's no honey-crusted lesion that looks like infantigo, and we just learned about erythema nodosum, and so it's not that. So even without knowing the answer to this question, we can already with good certainty predict that the answer is ichthyma, which we don't even know what that is yet, but we know that it's not these other things. And so that's what's good about learning to take test questions and kind of dissect them. So ekthyma is seen in diabetic patients, elderly, alcoholic patients, patients that are generally sick and immunocompromised. It's caused by beta uh, group strep A, just like impentigo. However, it's deeper infection. Um, you also don't want to forget that there's a chance that it could be Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, there are, are complications which include uh, involvement of the lymph lymphatic system, so you can get lymphagitis, cellulitis, and uh, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis as this is a streptococcal infection. So basically we wanna treat this like we would treat impentigo, but we'll probably give them systemic antibiotics for ekthyma. Next, okay, another answer that you don't know. Um, these are questions that you haven't got yet, but I want you to just kind of um, boil them down with the stuff that you do know. So you have a 63 year old male with a sudden onset of fish-like scale on his shins. He has a prior history of lymphoma. What is your most likely diagnosis? Okay, so psoriasis are those uh, silvery scaly plaques. This is not a good story for psoriasis. Um, let's see. Erythema nodosum we just learned about. That does not look like that. Lichen planus does not look like that either. So I would say we're kind of stuck here with this acquired ichthyosis and ichthyosis vulgaris. Let's see, 63-year-old male, sudden onset. So I would lean more toward ichthyosis vulgaris as acquired ichthyosis. Kind of suggests maybe over time, I would say this is probably ichthyosis vulgaris. Oh, it's acquired ichthyosis. So acquired ichthyosis. So let's talk about acquired ichthyosis. Acquired ichthyosis is an acquired, um, it can be caused from underlying um, conditions like cancer, sarcoidosis, thyroid disease, or chronic kidney failure. Um, has been associated with um, medications as well. Um, it's this fish scale disease because it's very dry. It's that scaly pattern. And also can present as keratosis pilaris, which is acne-like bumps on the side of the back, neck, and upper arms. So kind of a difficult um, diagnosis to make, but it's that fish scaly appearance with ichthyosis. Here's that keratosis pilaris. Now we've seen this on people before um, where you see this little tiny red bumps on the back of their arms. They see this on a lot of kids from time to time. So it's just a follicular disorder um, where the follicular um, 
cells get plugged and they form these papules. So it's predominantly on the extensor surfaces, so like over the overlying the tricep. Um, it can be associated with atopic dermatitis as it is an inflammatory type process and can also be associated with ichthyosis vulgaris. So um, for whatever that's worth, those kind of uh, birds of the feather kind of hang out together. Um, but yeah, it's basically um, you want to treat by um, a keratolytic. So you're going to kind of knock down uh, the tops of these um, papules so that they, the, the keratin um, isn't overlying the follicle and causing it to be inflamed. Um, moving on to granuloma annulare, which is a cutaneous skin disorder that affects adults and children. Generalized granuloma annulare is classically presents as a non-scaly annular uh, lesion or an inflammatory plaque. So this is another vagology. Um, but annular uh, granuloma annulare um, is idiopathic, um, but you get these granulomas and they're round. So that's the annulare portion. This is on overlying someone's thumb. Here's this on someone's leg. So the problem here is, geez, that looks like a tinea corporis. So what, what we need to do is do some skin scrapings and make sure that it's not a tinea infection before we um, go overboard and um, end up uh, treating these people um, for a tinea infection, although it's this annular granuloma, granuloma annulare. Um, let's take a two minute break here. So I'm just getting back to where we were at. Oh, sorry, going ahead of myself. All right, so we were on granuloma annulare. Now we're gonna look at Paget's disease. So Paget's disease is a disease of the breast tissue. Now there's this persistent scaling and eczema type ulceration um, around the nipple and areolar region. Um, the hallmark um, is the presence of intraepithelial adenocarcinoma cells, which is the hallmark of Paget's disease, but near the nipple is kind of the hallmark of this as well. Um, you can diagnose this um, by getting a full sickness, thickness biopsy um, of that area. And you wanna find those cells, those uh, particular epithelial cells, the uh, intraepithelial adenocarcinoma cells, and then you've got your diagnosis. So basically the treatment is, is derived by the um, progression of disease. So here's some of the uh, lesions. Um, both mastectomy and breast um, conserving surgery followed by whole breath radio therapy are acceptable treatment options. So basically you want to conserve as much tissue as you can um, and, and, um, and get the patient back to normal health. Um, you need to have clean margins. So this is definitely a referral, right? Here's some emerging, emergent skin signs. So um, these are some skin signs that we really want to get on top of so that the patient 
doesn't decompensate. This is the starfish here. Your head's going to grow back. Just quit picking it. <laughs> this is so true. All right. So meningococca, coxemia purpura. So basically, this is that abnormal bleeding or bruising that is seen from vasculitis secondary to the petechiae formation and the purpura of the skin when you've got this necrotic process going on and the patient is in deep doo-doo, um, but that's due to the lack of oxygen in the tissues. And so there's this necrotic feature, but this purpuric rash forms, this would be um, also with nuchal rigidity and fever and a very sick, sick patient to have this meningococcemia purpura. Uh, erythema migrans is seen in Lyme disease from a tick bite. The bacterium is Borrelii burgdorferi. Um, these are these erythematous plaques that kind of spread out. They look like a target lesion. You can also have kind of URI symptoms, chills, fever, headache, vomiting, um, backache things like that. There's the erythema migrans rash. It's a very characteristic target lesion. Rocky mounted spotted fever. So rocky mounted spotted fever is from a tick bite um, that, that releases the bacterium rickettsii rickettsii. Um, associated symptoms equal fever and then this kind of flat pink macular rash over the wrists really is where you see this the most and then the arms and legs. Um, it spares the palms and soles of feet. So that's kind of a hallmark of that. Despite antibiotics, the death rate is still about 5%. So we want to identify this quickly. So there's a picture of somebody with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There's the wrist involvement in those kind of pink um, macular rash there. Um, scarlatina, so scarlet fever. This is the sandpaper rash associated with group A strep pharyngitis. Um, it really does feel like sandpaper. It's these tiny little bumps. You can barely even see it on the uh, picture here. And then they also may have a strawberry tongue and it may advance to rheumatic fever. This is actually why we treat strep throat so that they don't advance to having rheumatic fever. So here's that sandpaper rash. It's hard to see but you can see just those little tiny bumps and it's gonna be feel really sandpaper-like. There's an example of the strawberry tongue. So lipomas, other lumps and bumps and lesions. So lipomas are benign lesions. Um, they may be symptomatic, like irritative or just cosmetically bothersome. Um, usually you can manage these with simple procedures. Sometimes it's not worth messing with them. Um, so let's talk about these. So these are some other benign lesions, Car keratoacanthoma, calluses, corns, and malignant, and um, melanocyte proliferations with this melanocytic nevi or solar lentigo. So let's go over these. So lipomas are mobile, soft, fatty nodules beneath the dermis. Occasionally they're tender. Um, when under pressure or they're at a site where there's a lot of friction. There can be superficial subcutaneous lipomas. Um, these can be on the trunk, the arms, the legs, basically anywhere, and there usually is a familial leak, link. Um, lipomas are benign tumors. They're mature lipocytes that are commonly an incidental finding. And you can see them on colonoscopy and endoscopy. Um, and they can also be found commonly uh, cutaneously. They're uh, rarely symptomatic, but may result in some sort of a hemorrhage, maybe abdominal pain, intestinal obstruction if they're found in the GI tract. They have no malignant potential in the GI tract, but can convert to cancer cutaneously as liposarcoma, although this is very rare. <laughs> so there's some lipomas on this guy. You can see a couple on his chest wall there. Here's some more. You can see this guy had a few of them removed already, right? But they're coming back. And then there's a bunch on somebody's arm. Um, general management is to biopsy it if it's hard. 
rapidly growing or really painful because we want to rule out that there's not something more insidious going on here. Um, if it's immobile or fixed, um, then we may also want to check it out and make sure that there's nothing concerning going on. This is an epidermoid cyst uh, with an epithelial inclusion. This could be also a sebaceous cyst, but at any rate, this is an infected cyst. So the treatment here is to incise and drain. Here's another, what they call epidermoid cyst. These usually let the skin on top move freely. And it's this palpable kind of cyst that um, doesn't really require any treatment, but we want to um, rule out other things and maybe refer to derm if the patient is concerned about it. Here's a pilar cyst. So this is just a cyst in the scalp. Um, usually we don't have to do anything with these, but if you're concerned, you may refer. Um, epidermoid cysts um, have a lot of synonyms, epidermal cyst, epidermal inclusion cysts, in, infundibular cysts, keratin cysts, sebaceous cysts. Really, it's, if it's filled with fluid, it's sebaceous. If it's filled with keratin, it's a keratin cyst. Um, but the majority of them are just these intradermal epidermal cysts that do not really cause any problems. If it's inflamed, we're going to incise it. If it's not, we can leave it be. Um, here's an acrocordon. So this is also known as a skin tag. Same thing here, if it's cosmetically pleasing to the patient, if it's causing them problems, um, or um, it's in a site that gets hung up on things and we can freeze it off or cut it off. This is a dermato, dermatofibroma. Usually this is filled with fibrous keratinous tissue. Um, if this is in a uh, unpleasing site or causing irritation, then you can remove it. This is a neurofibroma. So cutaneous neurofibromas are benign nerve sheath tumors composed of cells um, of the of the neuro. It's like a neurochymal region. Um, can be any sort of nerve cell can be in there. They can be Schwann cells, fibroblasts, paraneural cells, mast cells. Um, but basically, they're this kind of shiny. Um, nodular appearing lesion. It can be, um, uh, if they're all over, they can be a sign of that condition neurofibromatosis. Cherry hemangiomas. So cherry hemangiomas are these um, little tiny blood filled spots. There's usually multiple lesions over the trunk. They can bleed profusely if they're ruptured traumatically. They're often dome shaped and they're about one to four millimeters in diameter. They always blanch with pressure and some of them can be kind of uh, fibrotic and may not completely blanch. Keratoacanthoma is a cutaneous squamal proliferative disorder. The problem with this disorder is difficult to distinguish from basal cell as it has that telangiectasia, it's red. Um, it kind of looks like a, um, actually, sorry, a squamous cell. So a squamous cell has the more of the perfused tissue looking. So this squamous cell carcinoma is something that we want to make sure we um, evaluate for. So we may do like a Mohs procedure or um, a biopsy, like a punch biopsy to see what we're dealing with here. Calluses are just from areas of high friction. We've all had them. They're sometimes on your finger from writing so much. But basically, you've got this area of trauma that's repeated, and the body kind of builds up extra skin around it to help buffer um, from any further trauma. Same thing with a corn. If it's not bothering them, there's no point in removing it. If you do need to remove it, you can numb it and dig it out with a dermatologic curette. These are some melanocytic nevus. So they are really just um, moles, but they um, are suspicious for melanoma. So these ones we wanna make sure that we are evaluating and having a biopsy performed. Xanthelasma. 
So this is this yellow plaques that form on the eyes bilaterally. These lesions are primarily associated with biliary cholangitis and often um, you will see a marked increase in cholesterol. Um, so these are just kind of this systemic involvement from something that's going on um, with the lipid profile, maybe something going on with the pancreas or the liver, and we need to uh, identify the root cause of this. These are keloids. Keloids can be caused by any kind of scarring. I don't know if this guy had like some tinea barba or something like that, but at any rate, as he was healing, his uh, scar tissue just kind of hyperproliferated and making these keloid scars. Um, intralesional injections are helpful for keloid scars. Um, triamcinolone is the one that's the most effective. Uh, you can do anti-inflammatories for pain control, and usually these injections are done in two to six week intervals. Um, and they'll use this intralesional 5-FU, which is that um, medication that we talked about yesterday that's a um, chemotherapy agent. These are telangiectasias, so just superficial vessels. Um, they can be associated with hemorrhagic telangiectasia, um, epistaxis. Uh, they may even need to be screened if they're having a lot of epistaxis um, for some sort of uh, atrioventricular malformation. Um, children with these, uh, we want to make sure that there's no autoimmune condition, um, that they don't have any neurologic component um, that might suggest this. Osler-Weber Indu syndrome, um, especially if there's oculocutaneous telangiectasias or an immune deficiency. Cafe au lait regions, so cafe au lait uh, macules are um, flat pigmented lesions that are present at birth and early childhood, often become first notable following sun exposure. They may represent a localized increased melanogenesis. Um, so basically just excess melanocytes in this region. Um, there is also a link between these and neur neurofibromatosis type one. So that's just kind of a pearl to keep in your hat. And that is it for kind of the miscellaneous stuff. So I'll see you guys again on Thursday. We'll do uh, dermatologic peds. And then we'll do a whole bunch of review on Thursday for things that you guys are struggling with, as I know this is a vexing topic and there's going to be a lot of questions and that's okay. That's what I'm here for. And we'll talk to you soon. Good work. Thanks for your time.